Hi, everyone. Um, thanks so much for being here. Very excited to present this new paper on innovation networks. And my co author, Soma, is also in the audience, who will help answer questions. So, we're going to think about um, RD allocation and innovation network. So, the broad motivation of the question is that innovation is the source of long run growth. And a central question in both policy and in economics literature is to think about how to optimally allocate R&D resources to stimulate technological innovation and st stimulate growth. On the policy front, you know, many economies around the world have dedicated government agencies for the design and implementation of innovation policy, particularly salient as a policy issue in China, in the US. Within the academic literature, literatures on innovation policy and R&D allocation, these are large literature with long history. So far, the discussion has mostly focused on two aspects of this important problem. One is on the overtime aspect of innovation allocation, meaning the economy as a whole, are we having the right amount of resources? Are we over or under investing in R&D? And the second is the within sector aspect. Are we giving the most innovative firms the right amount of resources? A very important aspect of this conceptual problem that is still open in our view, and that's precisely what we are going to tackle today, is to think about the cross sector allocation of R&D resources, in particular in the presence of an innovation network where there are knowledge spillovers across various fields, various sectors, wherever we allocate R&D resources. So just to fix ideas, you know, this is a figure, um, basically a network figure showing um, a version of the innovation network. It's constructed using patent citations across technological classes. So each node represents a one digit patent class. It's fairly aggregated and we're only showing you the largest nodes um, uh, um, among all. And these links uh, uh, between nodes capture the strength of citation relationships. So we hope to answer the following type of questions. And we're going to have so some theory to guide the empirics. And we're going to answer these questions in data. That is, if we construct a network like this, how much resources should an economy allocate towards, say, semiconductors versus pharmaceuticals? How does the answer depend on the network structure? How does the answer depend on production structure of the economy? And you know, countries do not um, work in isolation. Many countries receive significantly knowledge spillovers from abroad. How does that change the calculation for domestic R&D planning and domestic R&D allocation? How are our countries actually allocating their R&D? How far are they from optimal? And what are the aggregate implications, if any, of the R&D misallocation in the data? Are some countries doing better than others? How do we have a way to quantify that in a, in a transparent way? So we're going to try to build towards um, those answers. Okay. So, you know, the paper will have um, mainly two components. First half will be theory. Second half will be empirical. Um, I'm going to first talk about the theory, thinking about a closed economy, a simpler case. Um, essentially, we're going to write down a multi-sector endogenous growth model where each sector will have a state variable. Think of it as knowledge stock. So by sector, we're not only thinking about production sector, but also thinking about technological fields or even academic literatures, any unit of our organization that we can organize economic activities and technological activities can be a sector. So it's a multi-sector growth model. Each sector will have a state variable represent the past accu accumulation of past R&D and past research into a state variable called knowledge stock. Now, when each sector, so the economy will have many scientists doing R&D and each sector will conduct R&D, R&D in each sector will benefit from the knowledge stock uh, in the other sectors of the economy and the structure of spillovers form an innovation network. So I'm going to think about in the presence of those spillovers, how should a society allocate R&D resources? So that's the broad framework. Let me go directly into the analysis and just walk through the close economy um, setup before uh, introducing international spillovers. 
the, the model is actually fairly simple by setup. So we, we can set up the model in two slides. This slide will be more on the production structure of the economy. And next slide will be more on the R&D and innovation structure of the economy. The production side is actually completely standard of a multi-sector growth model. So there is a representative consumer with exponential uh, discounting and log in the temporal utility. The consumer at each point have preferences over goods from various sectors. So I is an index of a sector. And these coefficients, these exponents beta captures the importance of a sector to the consumer. So beta I is the consumption share, think of it that way. And goods in different sectors, they're produced from a continuum of varieties, which are then directly produced from labor. And these varieties carry around quality uh, um, with them. So quality can be improved by R&D. And by having higher quality, consumption will expand for given labor input. So you can think of these quality as the state variable of the economy. It turns out the relevant state variable is at the sector level. So each sector, the average quality of all of its products, we're going to call that the knowledge stock. And that is the state variable or the collection of, of these knowledge stock across sectors is the state variable of the economy. Now we're interpreting as quality. You can equally interpret as productivity. They're isomorphic in, in this type of environment. So the economy has two kinds of resources. It has a stock of workers who are employed to produce these consumption goods and a stock of scientists who are employed in order to make quality improvements to do R&D. And uh, the process of R&D is coming next. So this is the R&D process. Each sector, we can place scientists in those sectors in order to come up with new innovation. So this is the flow production function of innovation. New innovation in the sector I at time T depends on some exogenous productivity of R&D in that sector, the measure of scientists hired in that sector, and an aggregator chi, which is crucial. Chi is the knowledge stock in the whole economy that can benefit R&D activities in that sector I. So chi is a combination of all the knowledge stock, potentially in all other sectors of the economy, that sector I's R&D activities can benefit from. And these coefficients omega IJ captures the dependence of sector I's R&D activity on sector J's prior knowledge. So Q's are the state variable, sector I's R&D um, activities benefit, at each point in time, benefit from these state variables. The collection of these coefficients, this interdependence in how a sector's R&D depends on the knowledge stock in another sector, the collection of these coefficients define the innovation network. So the matrix of these coefficients is what we call an innovation network. This is the flow of innovation. And flow innovation improved the state variable, improved knowledge stock via stochastic process. So, so these flow innovation improved the sectoral level quality with um, rates that's in logs, the ratio between the flow innovation and the knowledge stock. So the growth of knowledge stock in a sector depends on the step size of innovation and the innovation rate, which depends on how what is the flow relative to the existing stock, okay? That is the entire model. I want to note that here in an environment without any cross-sector knowledge spillovers, so this innovation network matrix is the identity matrix, then innovation process collapsed down to something very standard. That is the growth rate of knowledge in a sector is log linear in the measure of scientists hired in that sector. With cross-sector knowledge spillover, this process becomes extremely complicated because the growth rate of knowledge in a sector depends on not only the measure of scientists hired in the sector, but also depends on the knowledge stock in all other sectors of the economy. And wherever you place scientists today, will affect the knowledge stock growth in the infinite future. So there's a rich dynamic network structure of knowledge spillovers across sectors. So that's the entire model. Now, the key analysis is to think about how the society should, uh, should allocate these scientists across sectors to maximize welfare, to maximize growth, and perhaps some different objectives. Before I show you the theoretical result, I want to first use the setup on the slide 
to tell you an empirically testable prediction that comes off um, the innovation process, which will serve as a, mo a model validation exercise later. That is, the uh, innovation production function in equations one and two combined imply the following testable uh, dynamics of knowledge spillover. A sector I has more flow innovation output if the sector hires or uh, employs more innovation resources, hires more scientists, or if the, if the sector's upstream sector, the sectors that um, sector I benefit from, those upstream sectors have more innovation in the past. So when upstream accumulates more knowledge, they benefit sector I's R&D activities, and these connections are linked or defined by the innovation network structure. So this spillover dynamics is something that we can test in the data, perhaps using R&D expenditure and using pattern output over time, okay? Just uh, a bookmark there, we're gonna come back to it. So let me talk through the main theoretical results. The key analysis is to think about social optimal allocation, um, how the society, how a social planner should place R&D resources. Before we show you that, let me first construct a very stylized decentralized setting to highlight the source of inefficiency if we were to let the economy run decentrally. So notice that knowledge spillover is non-rivalry. Knowledge is a public good. You know, there are patent systems that can allow inventors to monetize the product that's being patented. But if other innovators in the future get inspiration from past patents and past ideas and past innovations and come up with the new patentable product, the original innovator that inspired the subsequent product, it, it's very hard to monetize that. So we, as a society, don't have mechanisms to uh, capture that uh, externality. So we just want to show that in a very stylized setting. We're going to suppose that we have a decentralized economy where only entrants conduct R&D and they do R&D to come up with innovation and replace incumbents. All incumbents compete monopolistically and charge a constant markup relating to the set size of innovation and entrants hire scientists to do R&D to replace these incumbents. If that's the setting, then these entrants have no incentive to internalize all the knowledge spillover that their current R&D activities would generate on subsequent innovation. So the allocation of innovation resources will be inefficient. And in particular, we show that in a decentralized world, in a, this very stylized world, the allocation of scientists and allocation of production workers both follow the consumption share. Meaning if a sector is more important to the consumer, the economy or de the decentralized economy will allocate more scientists and more workers to those sectors, okay? Intuitively, a sector with higher consumption share is a sector with greater revenue. It's a bigger sector. It has more employment, more profits, and more profits attracts more entrants. Built in, in this decentralized world, there are no incentives for these entrants to, in to, to internalize the knowledge spillovers their R&D activities would generate. Now let's come to the key uh, part of the analysis that is how would a social planner allocate resources in this world? The social planner takes as given the stock, um, the, 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 the vector of state variable. The social planner understands what is this uh, state of the economy. Every sector has some knowledge stock. There's some knowledge level in semiconductor. There's some knowledge level in pharmaceuticals and all of these knowledge will affect the subsequent R&D sequence um, in, in, in the entire path and eventually benefit the consumer. And the social planner takes those state variables given, tries to maximize consumer welfare by choosing across sectors at each point in time where to place production workers and where to place scientists subject to the resource constraint and the law of motion for knowledge. Okay, the planner recognized that the growth rate of knowledge in a sector depends not only on where to place scientists at any given point in time, but also depends on the relative knowledge stocking elsewhere in this innovation network. Wherever we place scientists at any given point in time will affect all the infinite future path of all knowledge growth in every sector of the economy. So this is a very rich dynamic network, uh, network spillover model. Now in principle, this can be very hard to analyze. How do we analyze the entire path of optimal allocation? 
Fortunately, we have found just the right formulation so that the solution is extremely simple. So let me first show you that very stylized result and think about ways that we can uh, go beyond that. So in this environment, it turns out that the optimal allocation of resources is actually time invariant. Workers should be optimally allocated, just like in a decentralized world, bigger sectors, sectors that consumers uh, care about more with higher beta should have more workers. But for scientist allocation, that's very different. Scientists should be allocated according to a vector that we call gamma. It's a vector that sums to one. So it's a shares vector that sums to one. In proportional terms, gamma should be equal to the inner product between the vector of consumer preferences and the Leontief inverse of a discounted version of the innovation network. Okay, what is the intuition? We can expand this Leontief inverse in a power series form. So this Leontief inverse can be written as the identity matrix plus the matrix to the power to the first power to the second power and so on. So when planner is thinking about where to place scientists, the planner understands that, well, if I have scientists allocated to consumer electronics, it's going to improve product quality in consumer electronics, which consumer cares about. The scientist also understands that if you place, I'm oh, sorry, the planner also understands that if you place scientists in a sector to do R&D, they're gonna affect the knowledge evolution in those sectors that have future um, spillover effects. So the scientist understands that if you hire scientists in semiconductors, they might subsequently benefit future R&D in consumer electronics. Furthermore, the scientist also understands higher order network spillovers. So if we do more research in electrical engineering, eventually they're gonna benefit semiconductors and then spill over to consumer electronics. So the planner incorporates all of these future network spillover effects, although these effects are discounted because in, in, the, so, in the social optimal allocation, because these effects occur in the future. You know, R&D in electrical engineering doesn't immediately give us better cell phones. They only create better cell phones down the line through R&D spillovers in the future. So as an example that I've been alluded to, you know, think of a, a, of a knowledge chain where R&D or knowledge in electrical engineering can benefit subsequent R&D in semiconductors, the R&D in which can benefit subsequent R&D in consumer electronics, then here, a very patient society, a very patient planner should allocate more resources towards the more upstream electrical engineering sector and a less patient or more consumer driven uh, society should allocate more R&D towards consumer electronics. Now the discount rate here is the consumer's subjective discount rate rho relative to the step size of innovation because if the step size of innovation is higher, then those future benefits would accrue more quickly. So the proper discount rate, the effective discount rate of society is the ratio between rho and lambda, okay? Why do I talk so much about patients? We typically think of patients as a fixed uh, parameter. You know, we don't do computer statics with patients so much. The reason here is so far we have focused on a closed economy. We're going to show that when an economy is exposed to knowledge spillovers from abroad. So if we, you know, when we conduct R and D in, semi in, in consumer electronics, we build on prior knowledge that's generated abroad that is outside of our own control in semiconductors, say. Reliance on foreign knowledge spillovers could generate optimal allocation for the uh, domestic economy as if we have an impatient society. So compare an economy, two economies, both at the frontier of, of innovation, US and Canada. US can be viewed mostly as a closed economy, whereas Canada is an open economy that relies significantly on knowledge spillover coming from the US. So endogenously, we're gonna show that US should allocate more resources towards the upstream and more fundamental sectors. Canada should allocate more resources towards the more downstream and consumer electronic sector. We're gonna formalize that. Okay. Ernest, Ernest, can yep. I have a question? Of like, course, good to see you. Result, uh, highly depending on the Cobb Douglas functions, especially on the investment. So by this assumption, we know that the investment rate will be a constant, no matter where the state are, right? 
So suppose that I have one sector really far away from the balanced growth path. The other sector has a, a very close to the balanced growth path, but they're going to choose the same uh, investment as on the balanced growth path. So in the, I definitely understand the benefit of doing so, if I understand correctly, because you, are, you don't need to solve the dynamic problem. The optimal decision is not depending on the state, right? So then this whole system is kind of evolves autonomously so you can capture on the path of this queue. Um, but as you said, you have some like empirical testable predictions how today's technology depending on past technology in addition, there will be another testable observation, whether the investment depending on the state as well, right? So say like they do have a lot of technology in this sector, they might not have a so high investment rate in this sector. Yeah, great, great question. Um, actually, um, we were going to um, discuss precisely this point. So notice that in general, you know, in the in this kind of dynamic problems where you allocate R&D resources should depend on the state of the economy, right? It depends on if you're very close to the frontier or if you're close to the BG balance growth path or you're very far behind. Here, the optimal allocation is timing variant, precisely as Dan spotted. It's all because of the Cobb-Douglas assumption. We have long utility, Cobb-Douglas preferences across goods, and innovation spillover also take a very convenient lock linear form. It's the lock linearity that enable us to have all this close form solution. So we can extend the results in two ways. Number one, so you know, generally a related question would be, what if the technological environment is not stationary? Right now, AI and computer science, they seem to be where the future is, but in 1960s, maybe we can't predict where those frontier will be 40 years, 60 years, 60 years down the line. Um, two comments on that. Number one, we can relax many of these assumptions and the result, this uh, result will still hold along the balanced growth path. It's just that these betas and omegas are no longer uh, allocation invariant elasticities that are model primitives. These elasticities will depend on the allocation, depend on uh, the economic environment that generate that balanced growth path, but these relationships will hold along a balanced growth path. And a lot of the welfare calculations that we're going to show can be interpreted as first order approximation around that balanced growth path. So if we think the economy is close to the balanced growth path, all the formula we show give you a first order approximation uh, using that balanced growth path as the approximation point. So basically the theory talks about a stationary environment. Number two, that doesn't imply that we can't handle changes in the technological environment in a deterministic and exogenous way. So suppose we know that the structure of knowledge spillovers across sectors changes over time. Say 40 years ago, computer or semiconductors don't generate any spillovers. Nowadays, semiconductors generate a lot of spillovers to other sectors. To the extent that these are known to the modeler, known to the, to, to the econ economist, we can essentially replace this formula by adding time subscripts to these matrices. So the optimal allocation at any given point in time depends on the knowledge spillover matrix in one year later, two years later, and so on. So add time, time subscripts, and the same intuition would still go through. But this is not a theory to tell you how endogenously the structure of technological spillover would change. As an economist, I don't feel qualified to answer uh, that, that question. Okay. I also want to um, make a side comment here that you know this is telling a society how we should optimally allocate R&D resources um, if we have a decentralized structure, say for example, when only entrants contact R&D or when there are uh, large multi-sector firms doing R&D, perhaps internalizing some of the spillovers, but not all of it, we can use these structures to actually come up, use this proposition to come up with a set of sector-specific R&D subsidies, R&D policy, innovation policy that actually implement the um, social planner solution. Okay. I want to tell you about two more results before going through the open economy and then go to the data part. Um, one is 
we're going to think about what is the, the implication of R&D allocation on economic growth. So we're going to denote A as the eigenvector centrality of this knowledge spillover matrix. An eigenvector centrality is essentially the dominant left eigenvector of the matrix. Now, this eigenvector centrality actually has very precise meaning and implication in the model. Number one, for any time invariant R&D allocation, um, vector B, let's say we allocate R&D resources across sectors according to a vector B, BI captures the share of resources going to sector I, then the economic growth rate of the economy, um, the growth rate of consumption, growth rate of knowledge in every sector in the economy along a balanced growth path, turns out it's A find in the inner product between um, this innovation centrality vector and uh, the actual R&D allocation. So knowing the innovation centrality vector, we can evaluate what is the impact of alternative R&D allocation on growth rate of the economy. Number two, as a corollary of this lemma, it turns out that the innovation centrality vector is also the allocation of resources that maximizes the growth rate of the economy. So to maximize growth rate of economy, we should allocate R&D resources into each sector according to uh, the, this vector. Now, the growth maximizing R&D allocation doesn't coincide with the social planner or social optimal allocation because the society doesn't just want to maximize growth. The society also wants to trade off between short-term benefits to the consumer versus long-term growth. So it turns out that the social optimal R&D allocation is always a weighted average between what uh, the decentralized allocation or the consumer preferences and the growth maximizing allocation. And the weights are captured by the society's effective discount rate. So a more patient society, actually, if, if the society is infinitely patient, we should allocate resources according to the centrality vector. If we are infinitely myopic, we should allocate resources just like what consumers would like. Okay, in general, society should allocate resources with somewhere in between. The last proposition of the closed economy is if we have a suboptimal R&D allocation, what is the welfare consequences? So it turns out that the optimal R&D allocation vector also is a sufficient statistic to calculate the welfare cost of R&D misallocation or the potential welfare gain of moving towards the optimal allocation. That is the consumption equivalent welfare loss from R&D misallocation is actually the inverse of the effective discount rate times the inner product between the optimal allocation vector and the log difference between what's optimal and uh, how we actually allocate resources. So if we observe R&D allocation vector B and we know how to calculate the optimal R R allocation vector, we can calculate what is the welfare cost of R&D misallocation, taking into account the, all the transitional dynamics as we move towards steady state. So that's indeed the exercise we're going, we're going to go uh, in the data. We're, we're going to, for a panel of countries, in particular, including China, very saliently, measure how economies are actually allocating R&D resources, talk about how they should optimally allocate, and think about the welfare cost of R&D misallocation. So that's where we're going in terms of the empirical exercise. Okay. Let me briefly talk about um, the open economy exercise and then introduce the data and show you the empirical result, which is the second half of the paper. So for an open economy exercise, we're gonna open up the closed economy that I've just introduced in two ways. Number one, we're gonna introduce the economy to trade. The economy can export a domestic bundle and import a foreign bundle. More importantly, the economy also potentially benefits from foreign knowledge spillovers. So remember, chi it is the stock of knowledge that benefits R&D in sector I at time T for the economy. Previously, it only depends on the domestic stock of knowledge across various sectors. Now we allow R&D activities in sector I domestically also benefit from foreign knowledge spillovers. In particular, these coefficients xij and one minus xij captures the relative importance of domestic knowledge in sector j for sector i's R&D activity 
versus foreign knowledge. So a closed economy will have xij all equal to one. A economy that significantly relies on foreign knowledge will have xij very close to zero. We're going to analyze unilaterally optimal policy. We're going to think about how the society should allocate R&D resources in order to maximize domestic welfare, taking the path of foreign knowledge and relative prices as given. Okay, so think of it as a small open economy exercise, although we also do the large economy analysis in the paper. Turns out that the optimal R&D allocation in this open economy setting that we constructed looks very similar to the closed economy case, except the relevant matrix for knowledge spillovers is no longer just the coefficients at uh, omega ij, but the products between omega ij and xijs, okay? So what is the intuition here? When a planner is thinking about how much R&D to allocate to semiconductors, because we recognize the subsequent benefit that more semiconductor research will eventually benefit uh, research in consumer electronics that consumer actually uh, value. Now, we, we, we need to take into account that how much of the semiconductor knowledge that the economy will eventually use comes from domestic R&D versus come from knowledge spillover from abroad. So if a significant part of the knowledge spillover are domestic, X matrix um, is very close to one. So we go back to the closed economy case. For an economy that relies significantly or almost entirely on foreign knowledge, X will be a matrix that's very close to zero. This means, uh, this circle, this Hamadat product means element-wise uh, multiplication. So when the economy that's significantly relying on foreign knowledge, the network spillover effects will be very low. For a planner, the planner wouldn't think too much about the network effects because we're benefiting from free foreign knowledge and the evolution of those knowledge will not be influenced by my domestic R&D decisions. So for an economy that's more reliant on foreign knowledge spillovers, the planner should allocate resources as if it's an inpatient society. It's as if we're discounting all of these network uh, spillover effects. Uh, um, in contrast, countries with self-contained network, as we were showing the data, and, um, in particular US and Japan, and China increasingly so, economies with more self-contained networks should invest in more innovation central sectors, more upstream sectors. Okay. Lastly, we also have the um, welfare cost of allocation uh, and, uh, um, formula for the open economy, which is essentially the same as the closed economy formula, adjusted for an additional scalar. It captures the following intuition. If I'm a closed economy, any R&D misallocation will be very consequential. If I mess up my R&D allocation, then it will have growth consequences. So it's very consequential. If all of my R&D rely on foreign knowledge spillovers, that means domestic R&D doesn't really affect evolution of knowledge. So the welfare consequences will actually be lower for a foreign reliant economy. And that's what this um, uh, uh, scalar captures. It depends on the structure of the network and interacts with how much we rely on, uh, on foreign knowledge. A more foreign reliant economy has lower R&D self-sufficiency and hence for a given degree of R&D misallocation, the welfare cost is actually lower. Okay. That's all we want to say about the theory. And now let's go to the data. So in the data, we're gonna do um, two kinds of exercises. Number one, we're gonna do a validation exercise of the knowledge spillover mechanism. That is the key departure from a standard uh, multi-sector model. We allow for knowledge spillovers across sectors. So we're gonna show some evidence that you know when a sector has more um, uh, knowledge, it's going to benefit all the innovation downstream sectors. And in our main application, we're going to measure R&D allocation across countries and assess which countries are allocating better and, 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 and um, what are the welfare costs of R&D misallocation in the data. So just to recap some of the notations and the nature of the exercise that we're going to do, we're going to try to measure optimal allocation what we need is we, we, we will need consumption shares or value added or production structure of the economy. 
we need to construct an innovation network matrix, as well as how each economy in each sector rely on foreign knowledge spillovers. And using almost the same ingredient, we can construct the welfare cost of R&D misallocation for any given uh, R&D allocation vector, which we're gonna measure for, uh, um, in, in the data for a panel of countries. So everything is data driven. The only parameter that is uh, calibrated will be this uh, effective discount rate. So the society discount rate relative to the step size of innovation. For that, we pick standard values from the literature, but results are very robust. So in terms of data, we're gonna have two components. We're gonna have one that is a bit more US focused and the more Nova part comes from constructing this massive global innovation network from over 30 million patents from more than 42 countries covering almost half a century. So we're gonna construct the innovation network at a technological class to technological class level. So this matrix will be an um, IPC sector or patent classification, it's called IPC, three digit IPC sector to IPC sector. At the cross sector level, we're gonna use patent citation shares. The US part of data comes from US patent office, which is relatively uh, widely used. The international part, which is the more novel part comes from Google patents. Essentially what Google Patents does is it combines patent data from more than 20 major patent offices around the world. <clears throat> In particular, it captures a synthesized data from US Patent Office, Japan's Patent Office, Chinese Patent Authority, and European Patent Office. So overall, it captures uh, over 130 million patent applications. Now, for intellectual right protection purposes, it's very common for the same innovation to be filed multiple times in different patents, um, just to be protected by the jurisdiction that's covered by that particular patent office. So we um, do a careful job to unwind those multi-filings so that for each unique piece of information, we trace out the original inventor, which country and which sector, and we attribute all the citations to various versions of the patents to that original patent. And we supplement this patent, this innovation network with production side information and information R&D using um, World Input Alba table um, for sector level data and use three relatively standard firm level data sets to extract more detailed R&D measures at the sector level. So first, some summary um, statistics for this uh, rich global innovation network. One, we're gonna show you um, sectors with the highest innovation centrality. So these are three digit patent classifications. So there are uh, close to 130 classes. These are the sectors that should have the most resources for any economy if the economy wants to maximize growth. So medical science, um, uh, computing, basic electric elements, which correspond to semiconductors. This is closer, um, so electric uh, communication technique and so on. So the distribution of centrality across sectors is highly skewed. So a few selected sectors should capture most of the resources if we want to maximize growth rate of the economy. This is a visualization of the network. On the, uh, on the left, we're showing you at the IPC to IPC level or sector to sector level. On the right, we're showing you country sector to country sector level. The figure on the left, we just want to highlight that when sectors are sorted by innovation centrality, here we can see that a few very central sectors are, are cited very significantly by all other sectors. And the downstream sectors are, are uh, barely cited by anyone at all so that this network is highly hierarchical and very asymmetric. There are a few central sectors that generate most of the knowledge spillovers to the other sectors. And these are the sectors precisely shown on the previous slides. The figure on the right is a visualization of this global innovation network. You know, uh, we're showing this uh, as a map for patents between 2010 and 2014. So China is playing a very big role uh, in this global innovation network during this period. In earlier periods, the, the role of China will appear much smaller. 
Um, there are two other salient facts. Number one, US and Japan has the most number of patents by patent count. Number two, US is much more important as a exporter of knowledge than Japan or any other country in the world. So there are very strong linkages um, of knowledge spillover from US to other countries. Japan is rel relatively more isolated compared to the US, despite having a large patent count. So this is a formal description of uh, foreign reliance or knowledge openness. In particular, we're calculating for each sector when a sector in a, in a country creates a patent and cites all the other patents, what well, fraction of those citations are towards domestic patents. If it's um, 100%, then essentially in terms of knowledge, it's a closed economy. So here we're calculating an average for each sector and plot a distribution across sectors. As you can see, US patents cite about 80% domestic patents. So it's relatively a closed economy. For all other economies, except for more recently Japan, for every other economy or period, um, more than 50% of citation on average are towards patents from other countries, in particular the US. Japan is an outlier in 2010 in the most recent uh, batch of data. Japan um, cites about 85% domestic. Lastly, a salient fact is among the fast growing economies, especially the three uh, Asian economies, you can see the degree of self-reliance increased very rapidly over time during the sample period. So China initially in 1990, um, only 5% of citations are towards domestic patents. At the, end of the, at the end of the sample, about 40% citations are towards domestic patents. So these economies are getting more and more self-sufficient, just not to the same degree as uh, Japan does in the, in the latest batch. Okay. Ernest. Yep. Sorry. Uh, given the last picture you show, I wonder how you're gonna incorporate a large open economy in the in your model. So, so far it's still like every country view themselves as a small open economy, right? So they will see their own innovation policy would not affect the foreigners' innovation position. Um, but the last picture show that those countries are particularly large and highly interact and correlated with each other, connected. With yeah, other. yeah, great yeah. question. So the, the only country in the world, just looking at the network linkages, the only country in the world, the innovation in which can actually meaningfully affect r and other countries is the US. So that question is relevant highly for the US, not so much for the other economies. Now, conceptually, you can think of our close economy analysis as the one for world plan, right? Now, in the paper, we actually have, uh, in one of the appendices, have an, an analysis solving the problem of a large open economy planner. We solve that problem particularly for the US, where domestic R&D will affect, we're going to solve for a national equilibrium in some sense, take what other countries are going to allocate R&D as given, and we're going to think about when we allocate R&D resources and generate new knowledge, it's going to generate knowledge spillover that affect us, uh, in uh, the sequence of knowledge from the other economy that's going to come back. So in, in, in language of game theory, that's a closed loop uh, equilibrium where we are analyzing open loop in some sense. But that analysis in, is in the paper. Theoretically, it's very close to the closed economy analysis just with some constraints. You can't choose R&D resource allocation in the other country. Otherwise, you're essentially solving a global planner problem Empirically, it doesn't matter very much. Empirically, the effect is very small. Even for the US, the optimal allocation, disregarding the spillover to outside of the US versus incorporating them, the effect is not very large. The reason is even though US allocation of R&D resources do affect knowledge growth in all other economies, the, the, the other way, um, the network linkage is actually very small because US relies 80% on domestic innovation. So, so the knowledge coming back, that linkage is very small. So when once we solve for an optimal allocation, it actually doesn't de depend so much on the specification. No, okay, the second question is regarding this page, 
it looks like um, the structure of X, probably the shouldn't take it as exotic given because the aspect is yeah. the country growing, it seems like the X is changing. Yep. So that's a related question to your earlier one about the cubicular structure. Here, X are the cubicular coefficients. So we say a country, uh, uh, you know, always depend a certain fraction on domestic versus uh, foreign. Mm -hmm. Again, if this is a general non-parametric aggregator, the features constant returns to scale, this relationship still holds along the balanced growth path, just not along the entire equilibrium path. So in which case we can no longer say our welfare sufficient statistic is global. It will be a first order approximation around the balanced growth path otherwise conclusion would remain. So we basically picked the specification that is the simplest, that also gives the most power to these claims, but a weaker version of, of these results will, will allow you to still speak to the quantification as a first order approximation. Thank you. So the, the Ernest, the, a follow-up question is, uh, even, even if you generalize uh, you know, the specification, uh, as uh, as well, as in your response to to Dan's question, uh, is it possible the model can actually uh, explain this uh, uh, time varying x? Say that you know uh, Japan uh, the self reliance uh, uh, went up uh, recently. I, I don't think so, right? Can can the model the the baseline the basic structure of the model doesn't really allow you to uh, explain that pattern? Am I right? It it can so. Think about what I am, uh, what I've been showing here. Essentially, I showed a closed economy, and in open economy part, it's particularly reduced form. What we're saying is there's a sequence of Q, a sequence of knowledge from abroad that you're going to benefit from, and I don't tell you where that comes from. And in particular, your social planner, domestic planner, takes that sequence of knowledge as exogenously given. Okay. In the background, when you embed this into a multi-country framework. And you can first analyze the transition dynamics of that richer model. It will be highly nonlinear, and the dependence of foreign knowledge will depend on the stage of growth. Number two, you know, innovation productivity and consumer preferences and so on, and the cost of innovation going from, or the, the iceberg cost of translating knowledge in one country to another, all of those fundamentals of the economy can change over time. So at the background, there could be a very rich multi-country growth model with knowledge spillovers, we are hiding all of those to the background to take out the simplest part that's necessary to give us the theoretical predictions that's actually entirely consistent with embedding this into that richer quantitative framework. No, so no, that I, framework yeah, will be able to speak to this. Yeah, yeah, I understand, you know, if you add some kind of uh, frictions, uh, then that you can see that. But what I'm trying to say is, uh, if we live uh, in the current model, say that uh, Japan made a big progress uh, in its uh, technology, and then you know, uh, even if you relax the Cobb Douglas assumption, then can you uh, generate kind of endogenous uh, evolution of X? My my uh, thought is uh, negative. So uh, of course, uh, you you introduce uh, say frictions, then you can you can deliver that. Ah. Uh. So even within exactly the same model, it can because if, well, it depends on how we are measuring X. X here is the elasticity of your R&D activity within one sector with respect to another and how much of that comes from domestic patterns. We're measuring it using citations. When this is no longer Cobb Douglas, X will be some endogenous elasticities that depends on the level of knowledge between the two countries. Say, you know, they are, um, it's a CES that's gross substitutes. When your domestic knowledge become higher and higher, you're gonna rely more and more on domestic knowledge and you're gonna cite more and more to it. So endogenously X will change. The more you develop your domestic knowledge sector, the higher X will be when we take that to the data. Um, so in that sense, yes, it's, it's consistent. Even I see, with I see. So in the long, in the log setup, the level doesn't really matter. So in the current model, yes. I'm right. But if you go to CES and the level matters, so, so then it exactly. has to be endogenized. Okay, nice. Exactly. Got it. Exactly. Okay. 
last, I want to say one sentence on the descriptives. That is, this innovation network is actually highly stable across countries and across time. It's only very weakly correlated with production network. Correlation at the country level is between 0.2 and 0.3. So innovation linkages and production linkages capture very different type of connections across sectors. And there's significant cross-country variation in the optimal allocation of resources due to both differences in beta or the production structure of the economy, what consumer actually uh, value, what they are exporting, as well as the degree of foreign reliance. The more foreign reliant economy, an economy that rely more on foreign knowledge, the optimal allocation dictates that these economies should allocate more innovation towards more downstream product, okay? Now, um, two parts of the empirical analysis. Let me go over the first part very quickly and go to our main application. The first part is a model validation exercise. Theoretically, we have this relationship that I have uh, bookmarked earlier. That is, a sector generates more innovation output measured by patents if the sector hires more R&D resources, R&D expenditure or scientists, or the sector's upstream has more knowledge from the recent past, okay? So what we do is we essentially generate uh, the empirical counterpart to this knowledge from upstream aggregator. We weight by the network linkages, by the cit citation linkages for each sector, all of its upstream uh, patent output in the last 10 years. And we essentially run the empirical counterpart off this regression. We show that when a sector's upstream has more patents in the recent past, um, it, the sector seems to produce more patents for a given amount of R&D expenditure. The effect holds both using the US patent network and using the global innovation network where each sector is now a country sector rather than just an IPC sector. Now, essentially what we're testing is in a, a technological chain like the three sector one on the left, we're saying, knowledge created in the knowledge upstream sector benefits focal sectors innovation. Now, this type of network regression is subject to the standard reflection problem, meaning if there are common technological shocks across all chains, all sectors in the chain, and if these shocks are correlated over time, then that would generate a spurious correlation between focal sectors output and knowledge from upstream sector. We deal with that problem in three different ways. Number one, we show that we exploit the asymmetry of innovation network linkages. We show that upstream knowledge benefit focal sectors innovation, but downstream knowledge does not benefit focal sectors innovation. Whereas common shock should, should not um, um, discriminate by the direction of the network. Number two, if common shock can hit through production linkages, um, as just as well as through innovation linkages, whereas we show that knowledge from the innovation upstream predicts focal sectors output, but knowledge from your production linkages don't necessarily predict your focal sectors output, okay? Number three, we construct an instrument uh, using um, variation in taxes and where R&D are located, essentially following Bloom, Schinker, and Van Rienen, using these tax-induced cost variation of R&D to show that all the previous things I've said actually hold once we use that instrument for uh, R&D output. So let me um, skip over the detailed result, but that's the gist of the model validation exercise and go to the main application. So the application is we're going to, for a panel of countries, construct the optimal allocation, compare with the actual allocation, tell you how they're misallocated and tell you what are the welfare costs. Let's start with the optimal allocation of R&D resources in China. The y-axis is the share of resources in the economy that should be allocated to each technological class. You know, automobile is a large sector, partly dictated by the production structure. Organic macromolecules, this is semiconductors, medical science and closer towards uh, consumer electronics. We can overlay on top four other top innovating economies and their optimal allocation. So relative to China, um, Japan and Germany 
should optimally conduct more R&D in vehicles. Um, very similar level of allocation, optimal allocation in semiconductors. The US should optimally conduct more R&D in medical science. And South Korea should conduct more R&D in electric communication technique relative to China. And Germany should conduct the least uh, electrical uh, electric communication technique and so on. So we can do this sector by sector for every economy in the world. Once we do this, we compare actual allocation of resources against the optimal allocation of resources. So on the y-axis, we're showing you sectoral share of R&D. On the x-axis, we're showing you the optimal R&D allocation. Each dot is an IPC sector. The dotted gray line is the 45 degree line and the black line is the line of best fit. Okay. So for the five economies on, on the top row, sectors that should have more, should optimally have more R&D resources do tend to get more resources. In particular, the slope actually is significant for most economies in the sample, although the relationship is weaker for economies in the bottom row. Now, the fact that on average, sectors that should have more resources do get more resources doesn't imply these economies are allocating resources optimally because as the scatter plot shows, you know, all of this deviation away from the 45 degree line are sign of R&D misallocation. If we move all of those allocations closer to the 45 degree line, welfare will, in, will improve. So we can quantify what is the degree of resource misallocation in these economies. In particular, we're going to quantify the welfare cost of R&D misallocation across the top 50 patent classes by, by, by patent count. So these 50 IPCs account for more than 90% of R&D activities in the economy in the world. So recall that our welfare uh, formula has two components. One is the degree of R&D misallocation. That, that's the inner product between the optimal and the distance between the optimal and the actual resources, okay? This is also called the relative entropy. It's a distance metric between two distribution of resources. This is the degree of misallocation of resources. Japan appears to have the most efficient allocation of resources. And among the advanced economies, um, US is behind Japan and South Korea, China allocates resources actually fairly well. This is for 2010 uh, to 2014. In earlier parts of the sample, three decades prior, China, Chinese misallocation of resources will be much higher. The actual welfare Hi, cost. Yep. Sorry, can I ask a question here? Mm -hmm. So it seems that in countries with a strong manufacturing sector, uh, the, mis the extent of misallocation is relatively lower, but in countries like China, Germany, Japan, but in countries with a strong service sector like the United States, United Kingdom, Canada, the extent of misallocation is surprisingly higher. Could this be related to the R&D misreporting problem? Because in the service sector, a lot of R&D is not reported as R&D because they do not have a corporate labs and they do not officially have corporate scientists. And could that be, I mean, is this about R&D misallocation or R&D misreporting? Yeah, it's it's very much possible. Um, we ha we have not investigated that formally, although um, it's a, certainly a possibility. My hunch is it wouldn't be a main reason for this. You know, first of all, it's very hard to explain this misallocation. We have our conjecture. If I have time to get there, uh, second, we are focusing on the top fifty IPCs. This is precisely why we focus on these top innovating sectors. These are 50 technological classes that account for more than 90% patent output. We can try to do this for 30 or for 20, just for the, you know, for the sectors where we know R&D uh, expenditure as well as patent outputs are actually properly measured. It's qualitatively, same pattern would hold. So, you know, by the fact that we restrict to these patent classes that actually capture innovation and where patents are well measured, I don't think that particular mismeasurement is driving this result. So we need to think more about it. So the second component of the uh, welfare laws is the openness of the economy. If an economy relies on foreign knowledge significantly, 
domestic R&D will not actually affect welfare. So in that sense, uh, economies like the US and Japan, which have fairly self-contained innovation network are actually quite disadvantaged. So in terms of actual resource loss, um, US is actually fairly high and China remains very low, both because it has low degree of uh, misallocation, also because um, it relies quite significantly on foreign knowledge spillover. So Japan is the most efficiently allocated economy. We can do a share and clean up type exercise and ask what are the consumption equivalent welfare gains if, all, if for each economy we move to Japan's efficiency level of R&D allocation. So it turns out that for China, yes, you can see the quality of R&D allocation improves fairly rapidly um, over the last uh, decade and a half or so. For US, you know, the welfare gain of reallocating resources among these top 50 IPC sectors amount for about 28%. For China, it's only about 5%. Okay. I'm fairly short on time. So let me just give a glimpse of um, what, what we have remaining and uh, I, will, I will then conclude. So number one, we can, by each patent class, we can compute you know, the degree of misallocation, you know, how much more or less resources should be allocated. And we, we can uh, zoom into a few technological classes that are um, more, policy, more salient in policy dis discussions for example, semiconductors, we find that relatively speaking, US underfunds semiconductor by about 20%, whereas South Korea and China invest more aggressively, perhaps more so than what efficiency would call for. Similar picture for green technology, US is severely um, under investing. China is a little bit over investing in, in green technology, although the mis degree of mislocation is fairly mild. Last substantive point that is about explaining this misallocation pattern across countries. We have one conjecture that have some empirical support. So think about resource allocation. Decentralized economy has misallocated resources because knowledge spillovers are not internalized. However, if a firm like IBM and Samsung and Sony and Siemens, if they conduct R&D or Alibaba and Tencent, you know, they recognize that any innovation they make in the firm may benefit subsequent R&D within the firm. So these multi-sector firms that are highly innovative have tens of thousands or even millions of patents. That's a way for them to internalize these knowledge spillovers. So what we show is indeed economies in which um, top 10% of innovating firms account for a significant part of total patent output, they actually have lower degree of resource misallocation. So Japan, for example, 10% of firms account for 90% of innovation. Whereas, um, so in China, innovation activity is also fairly concentrated. 10% of firms account for about 65% of innovation. You know, many other uh, economies, innovation activities are highly decentralized and degree of resource allocation is actually worse. So let me conclude. We provide a theory of um, how, to how to allocate R&D resources in an innovation network. We derive sufficient statistics that can guide R&D allocation and can be used to conduct misallocation accounting in closed and open economies. We show that planners should direct more R&D resources towards more fundamental sectors, but this incentive is muted in open economies that rely on foreign knowledge spillovers. We construct this global innovation network to validate some of the knowledge spillover dynamics underlying the model, and we conduct the misallocation accounting exercise. Japan has the most efficient allocation um, of resources. Moving to Japan, a level of efficiency leads to about 28, 29% gain for the US, only 5% in, in, in China due to rapidly improving allocative efficiency across sectors over time. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Ernest, I have two uh, highly speculative uh, questions. So the, the first one is uh, um, about cross country uh, and the misallocation, uh, but no, no, no. This is not the uh, uh, right way to, to call it. Why, you know, uh, the degree of misallocation across country, uh, uh, to what extent that can be explained? So one thing uh, uh, is related to to kind of one of the last slides, right? Uh, larger firms may uh, play a, a bigger role in in those countries. For instance, in in, in China and Japan, uh, but. I want to push this a little bit further. Say that if uh, 
uh, kind of corporate structure or anything uh, related to that can explain for for this. For instance, uh, in, in China, one explanation is a lot of R&D uh, is conducted by state-owned enterprises, and these state-owned enterprises are many of them are just conglomerates. Uh, it's pretty easy for for them to internalize uh, some of the externalities. So that's uh, one explanation, right? Uh, and so I want to seek your thoughts on that. And the, the second thing is, uh, I want to see your thoughts on one suicidal policy, uh, which actually can be analyzed in your framework. That is, uh, let's raise uh, 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 cross-border uh, uh, barriers for knowledge, for, uh, knowledge just, uh, flows. Say that uh, let's just uh, shut the X down to, to zero uh, uh, or to explain low level. And in a static model, then of course it will cause a, a, a huge welfare losses. But in your current setup, uh, that will create actually incentive for uh, the country to to do more R and D, right? Suppose the the country previously has very high X, and now you can get force X uh, to to low X. So that's a suicidal uh, uh, policy, you know, uh, if you think about it, but. Is that completely suicidal? Completely crazy in your in your in your framework? Did, did you try some kind of uh, experiment along the line? Yeah. So um, I think the the first part about SOEs potentially being part of a conglomerate that internalized this, I think that's consistent with this picture that we are finding. So mind you, what are we? What is the nature of exercise here? We are we first of all we say. Our notion of optimal R&D allocation across sectors actually looks, on average, pretty aligned with how countries are actually allocating resources. And now we're trying to explain all of those residuals, and we have a measure to aggregate those residuals, and that's that counts for misallocation. We're looking for country-level characteristics that can explain the dispersion in those residuals. So that's a fairly heroic exercise, just conceptually. But the story that you put forth is entirely consistent with ours, meaning if you are a conglomerate, you would internalize that if I do more fundamental research, all of my subsequent applied research can build on that fundamental discovery and I can profit off the applied research. So that's precisely what uh, this slide we're trying to convey. On the second part, our model, because of all the log linearity, it's a stationary environment. So it's not entirely at in its current form with the current theoretical tools. It's not entirely suited to study that question, although it will be a super interesting question to study. And you know, if the poison pill you 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 just proposed can benefit the domestic economy, meaning if we take a short run losses by uh, erecting barriers for technological transfers and we don't benefit at all from any foreign spillover for a decade, can we come out better than where we would have been with foreign knowledge flows? That would describe an economy with you know multiple steady state or multiple balanced growth paths. So that this shutting off technological dependence on externally would serve as the technological big push to foster development of the technological sector similar to infant industry production and, and those arguments. Although those arguments are made much more in terms of development and trade, not so much in the technological space. I think that's super interesting. This framework has some flavor that can be picked up, that can be applied to that question, not the precise tools that we're currently using, but certainly something we're thinking about. Thank you. 